What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world? I would like to welcome you back to the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. On today's episode, we have got on a returning guest. He is a professor of marketing at Concordia University. By trade, he is also an evolutionary behavioral scientist. He has written multiple books, including The Parasitic Mind and a book he put out more recently called The Sad Truth to Happiness. And this is Dr. Gad Saad. Welcome to the show. Uh, how are you doing? Good to be back with you. Thank you. No doubt, I'm doing. I'm doing well, man. How are you? Well, uh, you know, it's been, it's been a rough few weeks. First, of course, because uh, you're never uh, pleased when you see the the brutality that people can met on each other. But more personally, of course, uh, I come from the Middle East. We escaped Lebanon as Lebanese Jews, so I know all the dynamics. Uh, my parents were kidnapped by. Fatah, one of the PLO militia groups. Uh, I have a lot of family in Israel. So on a personal level, it's tough. But also in my public engagement, as we sort of spoke briefly offline, you can say anything. You can say the the sky is blue. And then people are going to be calling you all sorts of names. If you say, I love dogs, people are going to accuse you of names. Uh, I'm feeling tired today. People are going to accuse you of being an Islamophobe or pro-Zionist or a Mossad agent. So it's tough, but uh, someone has to speak up. So here I am. I hear that, man. How How is your family doing over there? So, you know, um, well, thank you for asking. My my uh, father's side, they, they, they're a family of 11. Uh, and my mother's side is a family of seven. And most of them had left Lebanon and moved to Israel many years ago, even before the Lebanese Civil War. And the reason I'm saying all this is because when you come from a family of 11 and a family of seven, and then those aunts and uncles produce children and so on. Basically, there isn't a single town that you could think of where I don't have some family. So I haven't been able to confirm, you know, the safety of every single, you know, kin member. But I did reach out to several people and I never heard back bad news. So God willing, everybody's OK. I hear that. Yeah, it's it's a rough situation. I was just saying to you, um, you know, over the past two, two, two to three weeks now, it's it's been very strange. It's it's very odd when these situations happen um, on multiple levels. On multiple levels, it's sad. I feel like there's always you have the initial tragedy, and then you have the follow up tragedies on different scales. And while you know myself and yourself, we are both fans of social media, and we've built large followings and platforms and achieved a lot in our careers through it you also really, really do see the the dark side of humanity. So you see the original tragedy, which is awful, and then there's the increased violence from the retaliation and the back and forth with all of that. But then on top of it, people just come out of their shells, right? The, the veneer goes, I mean, people come out of their shells anyway on social media, but you really just see the tribalism and the hostility and the sort of animalistic behavior and the true hatred that is in some people's hearts, right? When, when there are people being, when, whenever there's people being murdered or there's some type of tragedy or something, and you have people who immediately, their immediate response is to either laugh about it or joke or celebrate it or, or say, to me, that's really psychopathic, Yeah, right? Yeah. The people have, people have their politics, people have, you know, their sides that they lean to and they take, but Regardless, I always say, regardless of my my politics, regardless of my beliefs, whatever, when innocent people die, man, woman, child, um, my immediate response is is just sadness. It's not, oh, how can I use this to push my political agenda? How can I do this to stick it to the stick it to the left or stick it to the right or attack this person or attack? And it's like people just jump on these opportunities every single time. And I guess maybe it's always been like that, but we didn't used to see it. And now it's just, you see it on the scale of millions or even billions of people all engaging. And yeah, it's, it's, it's nasty. I don't know what, share your thoughts on that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you, you're exactly right. Social media simply allows the, the, the opportunity to amplify people's dark hearts. You're exactly right. Look, uh, I often refer to this example when I talk about sort of a, a universal code of morality. Uh, there's a famous clip that ISIS had put out many years ago where they were 
summarily executing, I think, about 1,500 Muslim men who were being led to the uh, uh, border of the uh, the shores of the Euphrates River and then were shot in the head. And so there's this kind of long, orderly line, and every single one of those is being taken. When I watched that, I wasn't a Jewish guy. I was a human being who was unbelievably angry at seeing this, right? Meaning that my moral calculus did not say, oh, this doesn't involve me. It's it's not, it's not, they're not killing Jewish people, so who cares? I saw a bunch of young men who had all lives ahead of them that were being just put down as if they were a piece of Kleenex. So you're exactly right. I think decent people can see a Palestinian child that has nothing to do with the fight, who's suffering, and go, this is bad. And they can see the Jewish girl who was raped and killed and say, this is bad. But you're exactly right. Most people, unfortunately, view the world through the prism of coalitional psychology. So they don't rise above that. They don't have a deontological set of, of ethics. Deontological simply means some absolute truths, right? It is always something that you should grieve when an innocent person dies, period, right? But that's not how, regrettably, the architecture of the human mind is structured for most people. It's blue team versus red team. It's us versus them. And I think that's, by the way, one of the reasons why, uh, if I can just segue to my evolutionary work, one of the one of the reasons why religions are so successful, and certainly Abrahamic religions, so successful in, frankly, parasitizing human minds, is because they play on that coalitional psychology, right? There is the, the Jews and the Goyim. There is the believers and the Kuffar. In Islam, right? The non which is a derogatory term. There's the, the believers in Christianity and the rest who are never going to get redemption because they didn't accept Jesus in their heart. So all of these religions have a very clear demarcation between us and them. Now, different religions might decide differently on how to treat the them, but they all play on that coalitional psychology, right? If, if they were preaching something that was contrary to the neuronal circuitry that <clears throat> that's in our brain, then they wouldn't be successful. But they're piggybacking on these systems. And so you're right. Once you go on social media, you really see the tribalism come out. And I, you know, just like you, because I do see sometimes when you put out a tweet, I see that it kind of personally upsets you when you see how people are being unfair to you. I, I feel the exact same way because, you know, one of the things that my mother once told me that arguably is the most profound thing she's ever uh, told me, this was, I was a young kid. She said, you know, God, you better learn that the world doesn't operate according to your purity bubble, right? That's that's an incredibly profound because she's saying, look, you have this view of this beautiful, pure world where people are going to abide by those expectations you have of them, but that's not how the world operates. And the quicker you, you close that incongruity, the happier you will be. Well, I still haven't learned my lesson because I go on social media and I remain baffled by the type of hatred that one can receive. There's zero hatred. And I, I I mean, from what I know of you, and I, I get the feeling that I know you quite well, even though we haven't met face to face, there is nothing, if I can speak for both of us, in our hearts that is dark towards anybody. We're, we're, we're trying to navigate through a difficult, complex world to the best of our abilities. We're trying to introduce positivity to the world. But yet a lot of other people don't, don't view our interventions in the same way. So yes, I, I share your frustrations. Yeah, it's a difficult position to be in. Um, you brought up deontological principles, and it's hard to know what percentage of people live by that or live by those and what percentage don't. Because even again, with social media, it creates a distorted picture because I, I certainly get the sense that the majority of people certainly that I personally know and I'm close with, friends, family, people I closely associate with, of course, there's going to be selection bias here. Um, it's for the most part, people who do have real principles and values, and they don't just sort of flip flop depending on how it affects their team or their, you know, their politics or this or that. It's not so tribal. Um, but then a lot of what you see online and what a lot of what you see amplified, it is this very hyper partisan 
hyper tribal, you know, if something is going viral, I always say by definition, it means that it's not normal, right? If something is, if an interaction is going viral or if it's making the news, by definition, it's not normal. So people will point to things going viral and point to things in the news and see, oh, look, this is happening all the time. And I'm like, well, you know, all of these trillions of human interactions that are happening every single day, hundreds of billions, trillions, where where it's peaceful and it's amiable and it's civil and people are getting on, they're not attacking or killing or insulting each other. It doesn't make the news, right? If a police officer goes and does something crazy and hurts or kills an innocent person, no matter where you live in the world, anywhere in the English speaking world, it's going to go viral. You're going to hear about it, everything. I don't know how many, I mean, just doing the math, there's 330 million people in the US. There must be over 1 billion police citizen interactions per day in that country. Yeah. And very clearly, at least 99% of them must be at least fairly positive and nothing crazy. You, that doesn't make the news. But as soon as something bad happens, it gets amplified. So I myself sometimes have to remind myself that, okay, that is very real. And this tribalism and this hatred and this anger, this, this is very real. This is something that exists. It's not relegated to history. It's still here right now. But I have to avoid falling into the trap of most or all people are like that because right. then you also fall into the darkness, right? You also fall into this dark mindset of, wow, everybody is just, has just got this dark heart and this hatred and lack of principles and all of that. I, I think I, I would describe both of us, I think, um, as realistic optimists. Exactly right. <laughs> That's right. And actually there's a book by Matt Ridley, the evolutionary biologist who was in the House of Lords in, in Britain, I think it's called the rational optimist. So you you called it, you, you slightly changed that, that term, realistic optimist. Look, uh, by disposition, I'm someone who's happy. Uh, and, you know, maybe we'll talk about the happiness book later. Uh, and I, by disposition, I'm someone who's who's playful, who jokes around. But I'm also, as you said, a, a, real a realist, except when I succumb to that purity bubble that my what my mother warned me about long ago. But that's why precisely you will often see on my uh, Twitter feed where I put, I mean, I, I, I don't do it strategically, but I'll just give you an example to your point about, you know, not everybody is a mean, you know, person. Uh, you know, I shared a lot of difficult, uh, you know, positions that I took over the past few weeks discuss. And, and at one point I put out a tweet that did go very viral over 10 million people watch it where I was, you know, quite pessimistic about, the plight of the West. But then a few days later, I wanted to also honor the fact exactly to your point that most many interactions are truly beautiful and hopefully speak to a universal brotherhood where I, re you know, I receive a, a million emails a day. And, you know, here, here comes a Pakistani guy. Here comes a guy from Kuwait. Here comes a person from Iran, all of whom are saying, we really support what you're doing. We're your brothers and so on. And the reason why I'm picking those countries, because they're Muslim countries. It's Pakistan, it's Yemen, it's it's Afghanistan, it's right. And so, yes, most people are lovely. Every religion, every tribe has mean and good people. And it's it's a great thing for us to to remember that within all of the quagmire that we're facing. Yeah, absolutely. Our podcast today is sponsored by the wellness company. As you guys know, I'm always looking for the best health and wellness products to give me an edge. But if I eliminate businesses that have gone woke or forced vax mandates on their employees, there are fewer and fewer companies that I feel comfortable supporting. That's where the wellness company comes in. The wellness company was formed by a team of doctors who lost their jobs for speaking up about mandates and pushing back against lockdowns. They offer live telemedicine and a wide range of custom formulated supplements to help keep you at your best. My favorite wellness company product is their spike support formula. It's the only product I've seen that contains ingredients researched to block and dissolve COVID spike proteins in the bloodstream. Taking daily spike support can bring better mental clarity and increased energy levels. Whether you're vaxxed or unvaxxed, it doesn't discriminate and neither does the wellness company. Get back to that pre-COVID feeling. Go to twc.health forward slash Zuby and use code Zuby, that's Z-U-B-Y, to save 15% at checkout. That's twc.health forward slash Zuby and use the code Zuby at checkout. Do you find that in your, once you get off the internet in the real world, um, at this point I've been to 40, 43 different countries and 25 different US states. Um, I've been to 15 countries just this year. And 
I've been recognized in every single one of them in every city, which is a big honor. Dr. Sat, I have never had a negative interaction in public with someone who's recognized me in, in, in an airport, in a restaurant, just walking down the street at an event. It is always positive. The most negative interaction perhaps I've ever had. Well, I got, I've been protested once. I got protested once last year, but with, with the exception of that, I had someone tell me, you know what? Some, I had someone come up to me and be like, you're, you're Zuby, right? And I was like, yeah, they were like, you know what? I didn't, I didn't used to like you um, when I saw a couple of your posts, but then I actually like started following and listening to you and you, you make a lot of sense. Like I massively <laughs> respect what you do. Right. So I, maybe, maybe they saw one of the more spicy tweets, first of all, and they were like, Ooh, you know, I don't know about this one, but then they're like, Oh no, actually, you know, we don't agree on everything who does, but I can see that you're coming from a good place and actually you put out a lot of positive stuff that helps people. So, you know, big up respect for what you're doing. So I find, I, I don't know if you've, I assume you have the same thing, whereas in yeah. the real world, it's incredibly positive regardless of the demographic. Yeah. Uh, and, and knock on wood, may it continue that way. Uh, if, if we talk about online hate, online death threats, then I've received innumerable, including in the past a couple of weeks, some pretty bad ones. But if you talk about in person, I've had a singular really bad one. It was actually a very ominous threat from a guy while I was walking with one of my children. Uh, and that required the intervention of the police and so on. Uh, I've had a few negative interactions, uh, not in the sense of, you know, death threats or, uh, you know, threats to my person, but in, when I'm giving a talk. So, uh yeah although to your point most ha have been incredibly positive and 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 supportive and uh, kind and everything uh the, the the most recent one where there was some you know difficulties was i, I give a talk a, a keynote address at usc last march uh on it was the, the conference was about uh you know the values of the en enlightenment and i was talking about the distinction between the ontological and consequentialist ethics and how certain foundational values uh, that define the West are by definition deontological. And so while we may navigate for many decisions in our life using a consequentialist ethic, and that's perfectly fine, there are certain principles that by definition have to be deontological. Once they no longer are deontological, then they're not foundational principles of a society. So it was, you know, a very professorial talk. There's nothing that should be controversial. And even if it is controversial, then let's discuss it. We're, the conference is about the enlightenment values. Well, if you saw the unbelievable hysteric hostility that then I, and the Q&A, which by the way, USC had said to me, uh, oh yeah, no, we'll, we'll send you all of the, we'll send you your talk and, you know, the Q&A and you can post it on your you know channel and so on. And I, said to my wife, watch how the Q&A is going to disappear because now they're going to say, oh, oh, this guy's got a very large platform. We're going to look back. And so true to my prophetic prediction, uh, the the clip of my talk was sent, but then the Q&A was not sent. Now they have to come up with a reason. So now listen to this reason. Well, we didn't get a signed clearance from every audience member that we can release that it's a public event it's a public event on exchange of ideas and enlightenment values you wouldn't think that i'd need to get a lineage of signatures clearing the thing right and plus if whatever you've said is something that you support and that you can articulate then why would you ever not want it to be advertised you'd want it to be advertised on my platform well that did. so long-winded answer i've had a few heated or ne I always stay implacable. So when I'm, when I have my professorial hat on, you, you can say anything. I'm very, very poker faced, but there was some hostility, but in terms of what you said, this really visceral hate or threats, I've only had one in all my life. So knock on wood may continue that way. Yeah. Uh, can I ask what, what was the thing that the, uh, people in the Q and a specifically took issue with? Was it something oh. from the speech or just something about you in general. <laughs> well, it's what what's amazing about it is that a lot of it was just hysterical and irrational nonsense. So the first guy that gets up, a very prominent psychologist, and he's like, you know, he he can't breathe. He's so triggered. He whew, look, I can't breathe. 
and he's pointing his finger. You, you're doing the sleight of hand on us. You're doing this. Uh, he's a German guy. Uh, I'm like, what, what are you talking about? What sleight of hand? You know, well, because so many things of what I was saying was were triggering to the USC crown. So let me give you an example of of content specific stuff. So, for example, I gave the example of some notable uh, people on the in the intellectual sphere who violated the ontological ethics when it came to Donald Trump. Oh, sure, I believe in freedom of speech, but of course not for Donald Trump. He doesn't deserve that. So I completely support that he should be deplatformed. This is not me speaking. I'm mimicking that position. Oh, of course, I believe in journalistic integrity, but to the extent that you couldn't have Donald Trump win a second election, then it made perfect sense that there'd be a perfect a, 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 a coalition between social media companies and uh, others to shut down the Hunter Biden story because the truth would have been too dangerous, right? And so I just happened to use the Donald Trump example to demonstrate what happens when you have a violation of deontological principles. But of course, what they heard is, you know, I've got posters of Donald Trump in my bedroom and I use them as a, you know, marital aid before my wife and I have sexy time. And so therefore, they're triggered by that. Now, another guy said, I am a, I don't know the exact terms he uses a whole bunch. I am a queer Latinx researcher. And I think that, you know, some of the speech that you're saying should be regulated by the government. I said, okay, what? give me an example of one. He goes, well, something like, you know, that men can't get pregnant, men don't menstruate, right? That 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 marginalizes. I said, so I just very calmly in my very, I said, so you think in a discussion of whether men can get pregnant or not, my saying that they can't get pre pregnant puts me on the wrong side of that fence, correct? So now you know why USC can't release the Q&A. Because imagine, and you know, I'm relentless, right? So imagine me releasing that clip over and over again across all of my social media platforms. It's not going to look good. And so, so what triggered them? My existence triggered them. My implacability triggered them. My calmness triggered them. My, you know, evidence-based thinking triggered them. They were just angry that I was given a platform. Wow. And so the audience for this was fellow professionals. Wasn't <laughs> exactly. Students. So this wow. wasn't the blue haired undergrad first year journalism. They were typical. I, so I don't know if it was by invitation only, but it was largely, you know, older people. So either professors or postdocs, or I don't know if there were many graduate students, but, you know, it wasn't sort of open to the world. But I mean, it was, it was a big audience, you know, maybe 150, 200. I don't know exactly how many. It was a day event. So, you know, we, we came in and stayed for talks all day. It was a day event on enlightenment values. And it was just insane. Now, even the people who were not frothing at the mouth, like the two examples that I just gave, it was still an underlying hostility, right? They weren't, because again, think about it. In, in, in university ecosystems, hence the reason why I wrote The Parasitic Mind, it is professors who were the original spawners, the promulgators of all this nonsense. So once you go into that environment and you say, hey, guys, do you remember freedom of speech? Do you remember freedom of inquiry? The professors go, what kind of corrosive, dangerous bullshit are you saying? No, there are some things that are simply too dangerous to study, too dangerous to say. What about marginalized communities? And so... I, even though you, you, your intuition is to think, oh, but they, they were professors and therefore they should have been calm and collected. No, they're the ones who are most triggered by this stuff because they're the ones who originated those ideas. Yeah, that's so interesting. I mean, in my, in my, uh, in my example, which, which was the, the one and only time so far that I've been protested, that was actually at a university in Florida of all places. Um, and there were about 30, about 30 protesters. It became very clear that most of them were not specifically clear on why they were there. I think they just heard that there was a big, bad, a big, bad, uh, you know, conservative or evil right wing person coming to the school. They, they didn't, very few of them knew much about me. They didn't really know my views and positions, which became very, very clear, even by some of the questions that they, that they asked me. Um, someone asked me what my opinion was on transgender people being murdered. 
I was like, well, I don't know what you think I believe to even ask me that question. Right. I'm very, I'm very, 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 very anti-murder. And it was even fun. It, it was even more interesting because actually the the challenge I had before that was because I'm I'm pro-life. And actually, someone wanted me to explain my position on that. And then this position after me explaining how I believe human life is sacred uh, was, was immediately followed up by, by someone wanting to know my view on people being killed. And um, yeah, it was very strange. And then uh, there were two girls who, this is two young women, uh, maybe let's say 19, 20, who actually walked out. They challenged me on my view that males should not be allowed to compete with females in sport just because they say that they're women. So women, right? Young women yeah, are yeah. arguing. I'm here trying to defend their women. own. <laughs> and the, the 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 moment that they 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 gave me the middle finger before walking out and I I asked them a simple question because they were, you know, saying that well, trans trans women are women, right? That whole thing. And so I asked them, what is the difference between a male and a trans woman? And they just looked at me blankly got very mad, gave me the finger and left. And I was just like, this, this right here is, this is the problem. Um, and something I've noticed through, throughout all of these things that we're discussing is it's not just the lack of deontological principle, but it's also just a, a sort of massive immaturity that, that I'm noticing in a lot of these conversations. It's, it's adults acting not even like children, but like, like toddlers. Yeah. Right. I, I find it very strange when you have, we have a, a grown man or a grown woman, 30, 40, 50, 60 years old, and their only way to react to someone saying something they disagree with, or that makes them feel you know, a little uncomfortable is to either lash out and attack them or to try to ban and silence them or to call them names. I'm that, that just strikes me as extraordinarily immature. Yeah. So I, I would add to, um, you're exactly right that there is a level of immaturity, but I think part of that comes from, uh, I like to use the term cognitive miser. Cognitive miser is someone who is intellectually lazy, right? So most people like to use shortcuts when they're making decisions or taking attitudinal positions because the world is complex it involves a lot of effort and most people are intellectually lazy so let's just find a shortcut to get to where we need to be and so if someone says uh, i believe in social justice i am queer the palestinians are being oppressed there is the bad jewish zionists who are oppressing them and therefore queers for palestine okay well, I mean, okay, let's let's explore this this uh, this position. Queers for Palestine. Someone said it's it's akin to uh, chickens for Kentucky Fried Chicken. I actually made it fancier. I can't help it. I'm a professor. I said geese for foie gras, right? Because it is literally impossible to imagine someone holding such a position if you present yourself to the world through your queer identity and more power to you, then if you're going to then say, well, which of the two societies is going to be more celebratory of my queer identity? Is it is it Tel Aviv, where it is one of the most gay and queer friendly cities on earth? I mean, short of San Francisco, short of Montreal, where I reside, uh, short of New York, Tel Aviv is a, is a hotbed of uh, you know gay life. So is that the better life or is the better position to take the one where in Gaza there is this really beautifully effective conversion program? It's a gravity-based conversion program that very, very quickly clears you of your queerness, right? So again, that it in part comes from immaturity, but it also comes from the fact that coupled with that emotional immaturity is an unwillingness to articulate all of the reasons why you support your position. And that's why in chapter seven of The Parasitic Mind, my previous book, I talk about how to seek truth. What should be the epistemological tools that you should use in trying to defend a particular position? I don't know if I've said that on the last show that I was on. Would you like me to expand on that a bit? Or Yeah, sure, go ahead. So... In, in, in that chapter, what I basically argue is that when you're taking a position, a truly important, meaningful position on a, a you know, a, a, a substantive topic, then what you need to do is build what I call an 
nomological network of cumulative evidence. What does that mean? It's a, it's a lot of fancy language, but let me explain what it means. So let's say I want to prove to you that toy preferences are sex specific, not because your parents and the patriarchy are sexist and they want to teach Johnny to play with the truck and they want to teach Linda to play with the doll. It's because there is a universality, an evolutionary-based and a biological-based universality to those toy preferences. The reason why I chose that example in particular is because that's one of the, one, the, the examples that the social constructivists use on their mantle, right? So it's, it's toy preferences from a very young age that then channel the the sexist gender roles that boys and girls learn to play. So now I come along and I say, okay, I'm not going to emote hysterically. I'm not going to scream louder than you. I want to try to see if I can put together a set of unassailable evidence that hopefully even my most hostile detractors will have to stop and think about. So how do I do that? I'm not going to build the entire network of cumulative evidence, but I'll give you enough of it that you'll see what the methodology is, okay? So I can get you data from developmental psychology that shows that even for children who are too young to be socialized, meaning their cognitive development by definition is such that they couldn't have learned those preferences. I could show you that little boys and little girls that are in the pre-socialization stage of their cognitive development already exhibit those sex-specific toy preferences. Now, already, if I stopped the, the cumulative network right there, it's already a death blow, but I'm not going to stop there. How about, Zuby, I get you data from comparative psychology, which is across species, comparative. That's what we mean by comparative. We're comparing across animals. I can get you data from animal behavior, from rhesus monkeys, vervet monkeys, and from chimpanzees, showing you that their infants exhibit the same sex-specific toy preferences as human infants do. Okay, now it's looking really bad for the social constructivists, but I'm not going to stop there, Zubi. How about I get you data from a wide variety of cultures? Because you're going to come back at me because you, you, you were well-trained at Oberlin College. And so you're going to come back to me and say, yeah, but that's just Western constructs. Oh, no problem. How about I get you data from sub-Saharan nomadic tribes that have nothing to do with Western cultures and they exhibit the same preference? Don't worry, though, you got an A in your feminist studies at Wellesley. So you're going to say, yeah, but that, what if, but that's only a contemporary thing. No problem. I'm going to get you data from ancient Greece where in, on the mausoleums, their funerary monuments, little boys and little girls are depicted playing with the exact same toys that little boys and little girls typically play with today. I'll just do one more and then I'll end, but you, you get the point. How about I get you data from pediatric endocrinology whereby little girls who suffer from congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is a endocrinological disorder that masculinizes little girls who suffer from this, this, this disorder. Well, little girls who suffer from that disorder have boy-specific toy preferences. So look how I've gotten you data across cultures, across time periods, across animals, across disciplines, all of which triangulate to proving to you that your position that toy preferences are socially constructed is, is insanely incorrect, right? But here's the problem to our earlier point. It takes a lot of effort to build that nomological network. It takes intellectual discipline. It takes intellectual commitment. It's a lot easier for me to just scream that Zuby is the white face of white is the black face of white supremacy and move on because that other thing is reserved for fancy professors. So therein lies the problem, Zuby. These consequential important decisions require effort, but most people want to cut through the muddle of doing the homework and just get to the punchline. That's the problem. Yeah, for sure. People like to have their very simple heuristics that they can use. And if something falls outside that, then just attack it or call it a demeaning name and carry on. Um, it's interesting, you know, Dr. Sad, I think the, the reason why I, I find so many of your insights to be unique and different from so many others in academia as well is I think a lot of it is connected to your background. And I think that we we have this in common where we've both been in and lived in and are surrounded by 
a true range of different cultures and people from different nations and different religions. We've both lived in the Middle East, right? We have an understanding of like, let, let's be honest, the average person in Canada, the average person in America, they know, they know nothing about, they know nothing about Islam, right? They know often very, very little about religions in general, very little about the way the world is in different places, what life is like in South America or in Africa or in uh, parts of the Middle East or in East Asia or whatever. It, there's a very, there's an extraordinarily heavy Western liberal democratic bias to everything, right? They sort of apply this to, okay, everyone in the world has this same worldview and experience or whatever. And I find that it makes people say stupid things and implement stupid policies sometimes because they they don't see how the things clash. When you said the whole queers for Palestine thing, that's a perfect example, right? So here in the UK, uh, where I am currently and where, where I'm from, I have said for over a decade that there you're you're inevitably going to get certain clashes because all of the things that they're you know i don't even like to use the terms the right and the left but it really is main elements of the left a lot of the things that they are promoting simultaneously do not mix well right so if you're doing all the pro lgbt stuff rainbow flags everywhere this and that and then three seconds later it's like yay muslims and islam and all this kind i'm like okay i lived in the middle east for 20 years and I know these things don't mix, right? Like they, they, <laughs> these, these things, right? You, you can't be a champion of both of these things and just think, okay, this is fine. Oh, cool. Like bring millions of people in, um, you know, go live in certain cities and whatever. And this is all going to be totally fine. And I'm not even here. I mean, I'm, I, I'm, I'm just like, this does not this doesn't make sense. But the, the, the truth is, if, um, I don't know, if a, if a white English looking person were to say that, people are going to call him racist, xenophobic, uh, Islamophobic, and homophobic, and, and like, he, he's he's all the things, right? I and yourself, like, we're, we're a little bit protected from some of these accusations because they don't, they don't land quite as well <laughs> when someone tries to... <laughs> Tries to call you a Nazi or call me a white supremacist, right? They'll Although still they try do, it. they do. Oh, I have been called Nazi many yes, times. Yes, yes, uh, yeah, but it doesn't stick, right? Like they, they can try it, but it doesn't stick in the same way. But I, I just find that people um, are sort of afraid to make certain observations and connections and talk about these things because people have kind of been deluded into this false sense of just like, okay, hey, we're the West, we can just like bring in every idea and we can have all this and yay diversity and we don't even need to have assimilation and it's all going to just magically work out okay and i think perhaps more and more people are waking up to the fact that okay maybe some of these ideas are not as compatible as we once thought yes so i mean of course uh, i'm i commend you for having done so for 10 years I've been doing it for about three decades, not to up one up up one menu, but uh, that's what's so frustrating for me is because all of the problems that now we're no, seeing, no one no one took me seriously as a child, exactly, <laughs> <laughs> and no one's taken me seriously. Every the, the usual exp, the usual reaction I got, oh come on, you're exaggerating. You're using your tragic background and your childhood in the Middle East to you know scream from the top of the mountain. But come on, it's not going to happen here. And so, and there's several reasons for that. One of which, I mean, several of which you've touched on. The, the first one is you're exactly right that usually the Western mind, and actually I just put out a tweet yesterday on that point, the Western mind doesn't understand the Middle Eastern mind. I mean, it's it's literally completely two different sets of eyes. Now, it is true that all humans are connected in, in a shared biological heritage. I'm an evolutionary psychologist. I understand that. But above that, those foundational biological universals are an infinite number of cultural differences, some of which are due to biology, some of which are due to history, to religion, to uh, to sociology. Uh, so when it comes to, for example, as you said, importing millions of people who come with a set of values that could not be more inconsistent with those that define the host country it really should not take a fancy professor to tell you 
oh, oh, Houston, we're going to have a problem. So let's take a concrete example that's very much related to, regrettably, the geopolitical realities we're seeing today. Before I do that, let me analogize in the following way. When every single day, if you're on a diet, only one of three things can happen at the end of that day as relating to your weight. There is no fourth alternative. Your weight can go up because of the set of decisions you made. Your weight could stay exactly the same or your weight could go down. Even if it goes down by 0.001 of an ounce, those are the three. There are no other states of the world, correct? Okay, now let's apply that very elegant, simple recognition to a, a wide range of phenomena, but I'll just start it with one. If you let in people into the West who hail from societies where according to many, many different forms of evidence, I can build you the nomological network, but let me just give one. Surveys in those societies regarding your views towards the Jew. And you get from these very nonpartisan, typically woke global survey companies, you get in those societies, you're ready, you're sitting down, 95 to 99% of the sampled people have endemic Jew hatred as their response to the survey. So now let's take that, let's apply it to, so now you let in a million people into Britain. One of three things could happen. Jew hatred in Britain can go up. Jew hatred in Britain could stay exactly the same. Or Jew hatred in Britain can decrease if you let in a million people where 95 to 99% of them express disdain towards the Jew. Oh my God, it's so surprising. Why are we seeing a raise a rise in global anti-Semitism anywhere. So again, that's the frustration because when you live in progressive unicornia land, you think all cultures are equal. All value systems are equal, but they're not. Cultures that don't treat black people as though they are lesser are superior to cultures that do. Cultures that throw queer people off rooftops are inferior to those that don't. But again, we've been taught in the West that what I just said is profoundly imperialistically racist, right? Mm -hmm. Because I am imposing my cultural imperialism on another. That's why one of the idea pathogens that I mentioned in the parasitic mind is cultural relativism. Because cultural relativism castrates you from being able to make deontological value judgments, right? It says, who am I to judge whether another noble culture of color cuts off the clitorises of their little girls. That's their way. No, 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 no. I have enough confidence to say you don't have the right to take a child and alter their clitoris forevermore, altering their capacity to have pleasurable intimacy because that's your culture. And so, so that's why because of this whole cocktail of problems, I put out that tweet a few days ago that went viral where I was contrary to my natural disposition of always being happy and optimistic and we can do it. I was like, I, th I think we're doomed. I think this is intractable. Man, there's so many things you've just touched on there. One thing that I think has massively happened over the last couple of years, because you brought up this point of cultural relativism. And it's interesting because I've been in an interesting point in the last few years where I left the UK as my permanent place of residence in 2021, and I've been nomadic ever since then, right? People are always asking me, where do I live? I just travel all the time, right? I was in the USA last week. I was in Colombia the week before that. I'll be in the United Arab Emirates um, from next week. So I'm just all over the place. I'm switching countries, switching continents, and so on. And something that the West has really, really done over the last few years and this applies to Australia, to Canada, the UK, United States, New Zealand, and so on is, in my opinion, through a lot of the actions and a lot of the things that are going on culturally, socially, and politically, they have undermined their own, how would I call it, their own values and their own moral high ground on certain things. Okay. So you brought up the topic of uh, 
FGM, right? What what is now being pushed in the West, right? What are they doing to children with the whole under the banner of transgenderism, right? You you, you see what I mean, right? So it's a lot harder to point the finger at someone else and say, hey, what, you know, 20 years ago or even 10 years ago, people could have pointed over and say, hey, oh my gosh, like, look at what, look at what that nation and society is doing. But they're pointing back and going, um, what on earth are you, you, you see what I mean? And even when it comes to certain things like freedom of speech and liberty and, you know, the, the rise of the censorship and all, all of these things, it's like, you're, 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 you're kind of seeding all this ground where you can't now, it, it's harder to criticize other places for these same things when you're engaging, right? There's that very famous line in the Bible about, you know, criticizing the speck in your brother's eye when you have the beam in your own. And it seems like the beam in the West eye is sort of growing and growing and people are not seeing it. And I myself, I'm not trying to make, you know, absolute equivalencies between all of these things, but I can point out, I mean, anyone who's even, you don't even have to be conservative. You could be anywhere from sane liberal to full-on conservative. If you're in a Western uh, English-speaking country, and perhaps even many in Western Europe, there are some major things going on in society that are that are very concerning. Where you might, you know, I talk to my audience leans more conservative. And I'm going to events and I'm talking to people, I'm talking to parents and they're like, man, like I had to pull my kids out of school and start homeschooling them. Or, you know what, we're thinking of moving to, we're thinking of leaving Canada and moving to Mexico, or we're thinking of getting out the States. You know what, Zuby, actually, I see you spend a lot of time in Dubai. Tell me what Dubai is like, right? I'm getting more and more people in the West having these conversations with me. And so, yeah. So, you know, when you put out that tweet, that tweet, I do actually want to read it out loud on the sure. podcast because uh, I shared it. I thought it was powerful. So you wrote um, on October 21st, you wrote, you are not going to like this tweet. So turn away if you are likely to be triggered. I'm a very optimistic person. I'm a fighter for Western values and liberties. I'm a dogged defender of science, reason and common sense. I must say that though I am unsure that the West can recover from its, I must say, though, that I am unsure that the West can recover from its multi-front civilizational suicide. Yes, I've talked about these issues for decades and wrote a book about it, but the past few weeks have crystallized the extent to which the problem has become intractable. It will be a long and ultimately bloody demise, and the West will be the first society in recorded history to fully self-implode due to its parasitic ideological rapture. It is a gargantuan Greek tragedy that will shape the future of humanity. This is not hyperbole. Your grandchildren will pay a very high price for your progressive arrogance rooted in the pursuit of unicornia that only exists in the recesses of deeply flawed, parasitized minds. Wow. And if I look at, uh, and if I look at the responses, everyone is like, yep, I agree. Um, I know. So as soon as I saw that, I was like, man, this is what I've been thinking and talking about for the last few years. I recently became a resident of the United Arab Emirates, right? Wow. I had a choice. I had a choice. I can live. I can move to the USA. I've got a visa. I can move to, I could stay in the UK. I could go to the UAE. I could, I have all these different options of where I could live. And I made the ultimate decision. You know what? I, I feel most comfortable. Like I grew up in Saudi Arabia and, you know, people have their criticisms of there, but I'm like, you know what, if I'm going to get married and have a family, I feel more comfortable, I think, raising my children out there in Dubai than I do in London or in uh, in the U.S. You know, there's parts of the U.S. that I like, which are a bit more sane. But I think just that decision in itself sort of says a lot about where we are, because I would imagine that 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago, I would have I would have picked the USA without much of a second thought. But then when I see what's going on politically, economically, when I see what's happening with crime, I see what's happening with schools, I see what's going on with the racial division and the gender division and just all these extremes and excesses. I'm just like, you know what? Um, Dubai's not perfect, but I can go live over there. I can be safe. I can You could be... probably leave your laptop at a cafe and nobody's going to steal it. <laughs> exactly. I don't have to worry about my kids being brainwashed. Um, they're not taxing me to death. Um, so when I just kind of did all the math of it, I was like, you know what? And, and there's people who will hear me say that. And, you know, they're like, oh, you should be more patriotic or you should do this. And, you should do that. and I'm like, bro, you're complaining about the exact same things I'm complaining about. <laughs> the only difference with me is I was like, you know what? Let me let me let me make that move. And so I just think that in itself is sort of revealing and a very interesting 
thing that kind of shows where we are. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll congratulations on your move and may, may you be happy and fulfilled in every possible way there. Uh, maybe I'll join you there. Uh, it, it might even be safer for me to be there than to be in Montreal, to be to be frank with you. Uh, we, we've had we've had that com that exact conversation, my wife and I very recently. And, and let me tell you what instigated it. Uh, well, a couple of things instigated it. Number one, uh, last Friday, I had a, a departmental meeting at my university, which I decided not to go to because it's kind of difficult to go to that meeting when outside your university, there are huge uh, demonstrations that involve some chants that are not exactly safe inducing for, you know, the high profile Jew. So that's one. On, on Saturday, I had another uh, university event that I was supposed to go to that I didn't go to. Uh, is is this the kind of society we want in the 21st century in Quebec, Canada? Well, then keep doing the exact policies you're doing. You're going to get more of it. But here's a more chilling thing that happened that made my wife and I go to a cafe. And she looked at me and she said, all right, where do we go to next? I mean, literally exact words. Now, she wow. might have said as though she's being flippant, but she was like, okay, where?" Wh where do where where do the Jews run to next? Should we move? And that's why I put out a somewhat facetious thing about China, where I said, "Hey, you better learn Man Mandarin or Cantonese." And then people got angry at me, you know. But don't you know what the CCP does? Again, you're not getting my point. I'm, you know, my my enemies' enemies could be my friend. I I wasn't making the point that I think CCP are wonderful folks and let's move. I was saying that this might be the last refuge where I might be left alone as a Jewish person, but. What really was sinister is uh, one, on one of the days that uh, my wife had gone to pick up my son from a soccer match that he had just played at. And so then she she called me. I was working at the cafe. She said, okay, we're, we're outside. Why don't you come out? We're ready to pick you up. And so I get into the car and my son, who's very young, looked at me and said, oh, daddy, if you were at, at where I just played soccer and you were wearing a Magen David, a Star of David, you'd be dead. Now, I want to I want to context oh yeah, I want to contextualize that in the context of a Magen David story from my childhood. And I want every single person who's listening to this of any faith and of no faith to hear this. The day that we left Lebanon escaping to not be killed summarily as were many people on October 7th, in exactly the same way that was happening. I lived that in 1975. When, and this I discuss it in chapter one of the parasitic mind. When the pilot, we were out of <clears throat> Lebanese airspace, he made the statement, We are now outside of Lebanese airspace. My mother takes out a, a pendant with a Jewish and puts it around my neck and says, now you can wear that, not hide your identity and be proud of who you are. So boy, have we come in full circle. So I left Lebanon. I've said this story many times. I wrote that story in my book. I just said it. I just got chills. I got self-induced chills. So in 1975, I left Lebanon and I had to clear the airspace of Lebanon for my mother to put the Star of David around me. As a 59-year-old professor who supports every value of the enlightenment, of classical liberalism, of individual dignity, my 11-year-old son told me, you better not wear a Star of David where I play soccer or you die. That's crazy. There you go. That's crazy. That, that's in Montreal where he was playing? or That's in Montreal. That's That was in the East End where there is a demographic that is not conducive to Jew love. I don't know what that unifying theme is. I'm not smart enough to know what that demographic group is. Maybe smarter academics could come up with how it's climate change that's causing them to hate the Jews. But it seems as though they came from a particular background. Yes. It's crazy, man. It's crazy. Uh, I think um, I think this century we're going to see some, some really interesting changes in the world. 
Um, I think, you know, we're by definition, we're, we're still in the first quarter of a new century. And I think that with cultural changes, technological advances, some countries progressing in good ways, whilst others are regressing in not so good ways. I just think that towards the end of the century, and even by the middle of it, we're, we're going to be in a very different world in a lot of ways. And one of my big predictors on this is I genuinely believe, I mean, we, we kind of touched on this implicitly. I think that every city, state, and nation is going to really have to kind of compete for the best people, right? I, you're, you're already seeing this happening in the USA, right? You're seeing people moving out of California and they're going to Utah, Nevada, Texas. People are leaving New York. They're going down to Florida. So, and people are more mobile than they've ever been, than they've ever been in the past, right? Um, and I was in, I was in Mexico uh, not so long ago. I met a lot of people from Canada. When I was in Colombia, I met a lot of Americans who'd moved down to Colombia. When I go to Dubai, I'm meeting people from all over, all over the world who are like flooding into there. And there's just a massive amount of migration going on. And I think that there are a lot of places where people think about them right now or they hear them. And it doesn't sound like somewhere that is appealing to live or ever will be. But my prediction is that there's going to be places that right now, you know, they, they don't sound attractive, but within a couple of decades, they're going to be like the hot spots. They're going to be great places to live. And simultaneously, there will be these places that in the 80s, in the 90s, in the thousands, everyone used to want to live in New York City or LA or San Francisco or whatever. I think they're just going to keep declining, right? They're going to, they're taxing people to death, that they're pushing people away, they're implementing ridiculous policies. And eventually, even, even the lefties, even, even the people who are call themselves progressive, right? Once they start getting mugged, once they start getting right, once they start exactly. encountering some of these things, everyone has a point where for themselves or their family, they're like, you know what, maybe there's, maybe there's a different option there. Um, and, and it's fascinating. I, I've, I've met a lot of, uh, when I was in Mexico, I met a lot of Canadians, especially people who moved during the lockdowns and during that, all yeah. that authoritarianism and so on. And they're like, you know what, w on paper, most people would think actually, you know, uh, most people on paper think, yeah, Canada is better to live than Mexico. That's kind of how, how it's sold to us. Most people would say, oh yeah, definitely pick the USA over the UAE. But then actually you kind of do the personal the personal math and you think about the future and you think about where it's going. And I'm like, oh, actually, it's not as clear cut as you might think. And, and there's people who get very angry when I say that, right? They're like, yeah. oh, Zuby is Zuby's shilling for the Middle East or Zuby is yeah. uh, this or this. And I'm, I'm like, dude, I'm just looking at the pros and cons. Everyone's got a different math. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I am a believer in go where, you're, go where you're treated best if there's somewhere that's concerning for you or your family, or they're taxing you to death, or it's not safe, or it's whatever, if you have the option. Um, I'm patriotic in a sense, but I'm not patriotic in the sense that wherever you are born, you have to sort of live and die in that place. I'm like, you look, if you're born in Lebanon and Lebanon is not treating you well, Please get out of there. Not. You know what? If you're, if you're from Canada and Canada is not treating you well, get out of there. That's, that's my personal view. Yeah, no, that's, that's beautifully said. And uh, look, you should be patriotic to, uh, to values and to ideals, right? Uh, I have more in common with I Imam Tawhidi, the Imam of Peace, with whom I'm very good friends, than I, I have in common with many Orthodox Jews, right? To our earlier point, because it's not tribalism that defines it. The, the tribal allegiance that I belong to is, are, do you share my universal deontological values? And therefore, I have a lot more in common with this imam than i do with orthodox jews right but but to your point about migrations to where you're treated right i recently came back from a really a major uh summit in hungary it was my second time in hungary and exactly in the same way that people accuse you of oh you're, sh you're shilling for the middle east whenever i say something that's super positive about hungary then of course the answer is but victor orban he's a nazi and so on guess what Hungary has a unbelievable reverence to intellectuals. Now, I'm not saying this from a narcissistic perspective of, oh, because I happen to be an intellectual, therefore I want to be treated as a star. But when you go to the parks, the monuments are of Nobel Prize winners, of literary people, of famous uh, scientists, 
of Nobel Peace Prize winners. Every monument there is about art, is about philosophy, is about science. When I get there, I'm treated like a rock star. Again, it's not because they're catering to my ego, but what I'm saying is it's a culture that is navigating in intellectual stuff, right? They're in, right, they, they've, right? On the other hand, in Quebec, and again, I don't mean to to be only that. I mean, I'm I'm forever grateful that you know Canada let me in when we were escaping Lebanon. That will always be a sense of gratitude. But you also have to be honest. If you love your country and it's going down the wrong path, you also have to speak about it. Well, you may or may not know this, uh, Zubi, but in uh, when my when my book came, my latest book came out, uh, the, the day of the book release, I appeared. I'm going to link it to Quebec in a second. When my latest book came out, I appeared on Joe Rogan's show to, you know, to chat, to discuss it, right? And about halfway through the conversation, I don't remember exactly when it was, I made a flippant joke, like a, a really just a flippant joke about the French Canadian accent. Yeah, I heard now, that. I happen to be Francophone. I, I speak fluent French. I learned French before English, okay? So I don't need to be lectured about French, okay? It was, and I used a, a gadism, something that I use when I'm describing people who love the Beatles, people who love you too, people who don't love Lionel Messi. I say, you're an affront to human dignity. It's it's a joke. It's one of my hyperbolic humor thing. So I said, oh, the French Canadian accent is an affront to human dignity. For the next three weeks, luckily I was in California. I received more threats than all of the Islamists that have ever sent me anything. I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not exaggerating. Many many, I don't know how many hundreds of calls to have me fired. 30 year chaired professor. Probably now the best known professor in Canada. I'm not trying to be immodest. I'm trying to make a point. Uh, luckily uh, Jordan Peterson has retired from academia. <laughs> now I can take that mantle because otherwise he was <laughs> hogging all the attention. Okay? And yes, for you idiots out there who don't get this, he's a personal friend of mine. I only wish him the best. I love that he's successful. I'm joking. But for the next three weeks, I was public enemy number one of Quebec. The, the French Canadian media had never noticed me for the past 30 years. But once I made a flippant joke on their accent, now I was worthy of every hit. I should be fine. As a matter of fact, hey, and actually they said those words. Hey, why don't you go back on your camel and sell falafels back in in the Middle East. Oh, but what happened to inclusivity? I thought Quebec is built on the feminine, I love, you love, sharing is caring. It was no longer applicable because you made fun of our accent. Now, now let me come back to your point. Do I feel more comfortable where I go to Hungary and I'm treated, I think, with the due respect that I'm owed? Or should I be in Quebec where I become the biggest garbage ingrate immigrant scum because I made a joke about your the auditory sound of your accent. Maybe I need to move to Budapest, Subi. Man, I'll tell you something. No one knows this, actually. I almost moved to Budapest back in about 2013, 2012, 2013. It's one of my favorite cities. I've been oh, there. It's magical. Been there, yeah, I've been there four times. I was I was debating between Budapest and Prague. But at that time, I wasn't yet um, location independent in terms of my finances. Right. So now I can make money anywhere in the world. But at the time, I my money my income was connected to the UK, so that's why I didn't actually end up pulling the trigger. But um, I recommend to all my listeners. People will probably get tired of me saying it, man. Um, I do believe in go where you're treated best. I think at least put in the position if you can where you and your family have options, because both from just looking around the world and from looking at history, you don't know what, what's coming down the pipeline. You don't know when stuff is going to hit the fan. You might think that things are safe, but things could go crazy. You, you, you just never know. I think it's good to have a mentality and then an optionality, whether this is in terms of passports or residencies or visas or whatever, just so that you know, you've know you got a backup plan. Hopefully, you, you never need to use it, but I think it's a good thing to have. Uh, Dr. Sad, every time I talk to you, I feel like we could go on for such a long time. We didn't even, we didn't even get to your book. I really, <laughs> I, I, I wanted to get into the book cause that no would worries. have been a lot more, you know, positive and, and happy, but we can discuss that the next time. Thank but so where much. can, where can people find and follow you online? And so, actually, yeah. sorry, after that, 
give us something to be happy about. <laughs> well, uh, this conversation demonstrates uh, how the world should be uh, organized. You have one uh, black lady, Zubi. Uh, you have a Jew of color, Gad. One is Christian. One is Jewish. Uh, not a strong practicing Jew, but very Jewish. All that stuff is erased. Two people are in a spiritual tango of conversation. Imagine if everybody approached every minutia of their life in this way. Treat people with dignity, forget about religious, right? I judge Zubi by the totality of his qualities and his flaws. And then I come up with an evaluation. I don't give a damn about his skin color. I don't care about his religion. Zubi is a is a multifaceted, uh, you know, product, and therefore I'm going to judge him based on the totality of that personhood. So, what to be happy about? If more people do what we're doing here, uh, and I know it's a bit of a you know utopia, it's a bit of John Lennon imagine, but that's how live your life as a playground. You certainly do when you're saying that you're going around to 43 countries. The world is your oyster. There's so much. Have fun, play, treat people nicely, be positive. Forget about these ancestral tribal garbage. Forget about Trump and Biden. Y you know, it's a very short ride on this earth. Every moment is, is precious. Take advantage of it. Hopefully that inspires people. Uh, where, do, where can you find me? Uh, well, of course, I've got my a website that lists everything where you can find me on social media and so on. I'm not, I'm not hard to find. If people want to find some secrets of how to be happy, The Sad Truth About Happiness, Eight Secrets for Leading the Good Life, super positive book, super optimistic. It's a mixture of my personal experiences coupled with ancient wisdoms and contemporary science on happiness. And you've got a really cool melange. Maybe we'll talk about it next time. And I, still owe, I now owe you three visits on my show because this is the third time that you've kindly invited me on yours. So uh, get ready for an invitation on my show. Awesome, man. Dr. Sad, I really appreciate it. Everyone listening, um, I highly recommend the book. It is called The um, sad, sad, truth. Sad, truth about, sad Truth About Happiness. Um, I'm halfway through it right now. I wish that you had read the audiobook. I have the same complaint that Joe Rogan did. I wish that you'd read it. Make sure you do on the next one because you, you've got a great voice. Um, but yeah, it's an awesome book. I really like the part about um, relationships and marriage. That's super important and we need more of that. So thanks for coming on the show, man. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Great to be with you.